Okay. All right, looks like it's one o'clock, so we'll get started. Hopefully, not fall asleep from lunch. Um, thank you all for coming out to this talk on Angular directives. Um, it's called. Well, it's not called that. There we go. Okay. It's called orchestrating apps by composing Angular directives. And so this is a kind of twofold talk. And I want to first start off, we'll look at just the idea of composition and uh, the idea of building modular applications and specifically with the idea of components. So we'll be talking about directives, but these kind of ideas you can apply to say web components with Polymer or even React and the components it is. So it's, I like this kind of approach and I think it works really well in uh, frameworks today. So we'll look at that kind of high level composition idea and then we'll dive into actually applying these uh, concepts with Angular directives. So there'll be lots of code. Don't worry, I'll have a repo link at the end so you can check it out later if you're interested. So just introduction, I'm Jeremy Fairbank. I'm a web developer. Um, work for a company called Push. Uh, we're a design and development agency uh, and focus a lot on front-end work. Uh, we also have our own product called Simply Built and it's a website builder, uh, editor, focused for uh, small and medium businesses uh, and personal use. And it's actually built with Angular. So some of these ideas were born out of work that's been done on our Simply Built product. If you want to uh, follow me, I'm on Twitter as El Papa Pollo and GitHub on Jay Fairbank. And I have a blog as well, blog.jeremyfairbank.com. So I want to start off just by saying building applications is hard. The actual act of building an application, that's not really hard, but approaching it in a way that is maintainable and thoughtful as you look toward, say, the future of your application and as it grows, that concept can be pretty difficult sometimes. So related to that is I want us to think about then who is software for? When we're building these applications, who are we building it for? And that'll help frame the idea of how building applications can be hard and ways we can approach it to make it easier by looking at who it's built for. Well, obviously, it's built for computers. That's what runs our applications. And it's obviously also for users, the people that are going to actually use our applications. We have to build it in ways that are functional and easy for them to use. But software is also for programmers, like me and like you. So when we think of it in that way, we want to build software that obviously is readable, is maintainable, um, so that if you write something and you return to it six months later, you don't look at it and say to yourself, what in the world did I write? Because I have no idea what's going on now. So software then, it has some competing goals. Obviously performance. Our applications need to be fast, they need to be responsive. And so performance is a pretty big deal. We always want to think about that. Maintainability. So as our application grows, how easy is it to fix bugs or to uh, add new features? Is it hard to get back into the code base or is it pretty easy? Shipping code, that's important too. We have deadlines sometimes on our projects and we have to get the, the applications out the door. So we have to keep that in mind as well. I already mentioned readability. How well can you come back to your code or your colleagues' code and understand it, know what's going on? Scalability. And by scalability here, I'm talking more from a front-end perspective. I'm not talking about like scaling out servers, but more so adding features um, or adding new modules to your code base. How easy is it to do that? So how well can it sc scale out in that manner? And specifically then, based on where we're going with this talk, I want to focus on these three. Maintainability, readability, scalability. Performance of shipping code are very important, but sometimes we find if we focus too much on those, we've got to meet the deadlines, we've got to uh, make sure it's really performant, and we don't make sure we think about maintainability, that could end up biting us later down the road, especially when we need to add new features, and it's not so easy, so it makes it harder to ship the code as quickly as possible. So we have design patterns. They make it easier. And we've done that for many years in lots of other languages like Java. Think of the, the Gang of Four design patterns. 
And so why can't we use some of them with JavaScript frameworks? So that's where I want to lead us into then composition. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about composition, especially in the JavaScript world, thinking about functional programming. Probably as of late, you've heard some discussions over composition, over inheritance, and the class keyword in JavaScript's evil in ES6. So let's, let's look into composition and see what it really is about. So what is composition at sort of a high level? You can think about music, like musical composition. But why, why do you think it's called composition? We have notes, we have chords, we have rhythm, we have a melody. All these little things are coming together to make this beautiful musical composition. So each can operate on their own, but together they make something even greater and beautiful. Same idea applies to art. So a compositional style piece of art, you have these blocks here, they're fit together, and you could argue they're pretty on their own, but together they make even a more interesting uh, piece of art. So, kind of summing that up with this quote and another one that will follow, it's from Wikipedia, I got this. Uh, the various visual elements known as elements of design, formal elements, or elements of art are the vocabulary with which the visual artist composes. These elements in the overall design usually relate to each other and to the whole artwork. And then the shorter one. The way in which something is put together or arranged. The combination of parts or elements that make up something. So we saw that with music. We saw that with art. These little things, they come together and they make something grander, more beautiful. And so we're creating with small independent pieces. And when we think of that in software then, composition is kind of like an embodiment of many of those design principles that we've seen or learn about. So what kind of design principles am I talking about? So there's modularity, separating out your code base into modules where it focuses on a certain feature. You've also probably heard of that as separation of concerns. You want to keep these things with a single responsibility, whatever class or um, module or functions. Also related to that is loose coupling. So these modules, they're going to be pretty focused on one thing, and you don't want them um, depending too much on each other. Because with that tight coupling, then, it's almost as if you just put them all together in a module. High cohesion. The modules, again, single responsibility. They do something, one thing, they do it really well. And then I mentioned composition over inheritance. That's another design principle you hear of. And ad nauseum. And, and a lot of these, you'll see, there's, there's a lot of crossover and blending between these design principles. And composition is a way to, it kind of wraps over a lot of these, and we see them come to fruition through the idea of composition. So now that we've kind of seen high level, what, what do I mean by composition? What, what is it? Let's start digging into the Angular portion of this. And we'll just quickly go through a review on directives. So you know directives are a way for us to attach behavior to the DOM. We can extend it, add additional functionality. So really, we're using HTML elements to create our modules, so to speak. And that's what I mean by the sort of directives-driven uh, approach, or web components, or React components. And so you're basically, yeah, you're creating custom HTML elements to use. So examples, I could create this My Hello World custom element, and it takes in a language attribute and displays it in English. Or a name tag attribute where I can pass in a name. So if we look closer at like a name tag uh, directive, here's what it kind of would look like. You'd start off with some module, maybe an application to attach your directive to. And then the directive, you provide a string name. We're going to call it a name tag. And then a function for defining it. And when we define it, we're really just going to return this object literal, which are some options that describe our uh, directive. And then to instantiate it, we will just call it like a normal HTML element name tag, and I can pass in the name, my name, and it displays it. Or I could even set up my directive to have some defaults if I don't supply an attribute. So looking deeper at those options, the first one you'll see is this restrict option. And usually, I usually like to only do it as an element, but you can also um, set your directive up to be instantiated by an attribute. And this is a, sometimes a good way to customize existing HTML elements, like a div tag or an anchor tag. And then you can also do it via class name. So you just supply one of these, or a combination of them. 
to the restrict option. There's a scope option. This is specifically an isolate scope, and I won't dive into it yet. We'll have another slide that dives into it more. We have template. We need something to display, obviously, so you can supply a template string or even a URL if your template is a little longer and you don't really want to stuff it all on one string like that. And then we have a link function. And there's also a controller function. And these are ways to provide additional setup or initialization of the scope. Uh, and with link, you might manipulate the DOM or attach some event handlers kind of behind the scenes for your component or directive. So putting these two together then and looking at the scope now, this is an isolate scope. And notice what I'm doing here. So when I define the scope up on the directive, I give an object literal. I have a name. And it's mapping to this at symbol. And that's at symbol is basically saying treat this as if it were a normal HTML attribute. So when I pass in Jeremy Fairbank down there on the bottom, it's taking in that as a string literal, and it's going to set it on the scope on the name property. And we'll actually we'll dive even further into um, isolate scope as we start working through some more examples. And also with the link function I mentioned, we could provide uh, some default setup. So in this case, if name wasn't injected from the scope, from the attribute, we can go ahead and set up a default in this manner. All right, so now let's actually look at composition and how it's going to relate to Angular. So as I mentioned with uh, composition, we're concerned with smaller pieces and those things coming together to make something larger. So it's easier way to solve our large problem by focusing on the smaller problems. So by using composition, we'll find we're going to be actually applying some of those design principles to our directives, like modularity, separation of concerns. So the app, what we think of as the app, is just really directives being composed together. We will still have some controllers, maybe, and definitely some services and other things in our application. But we'll find a lot of it can be built within the terms of these directives. And then even our directives themselves, the large ones, they can be broken down into even smaller directives. So we keep just going down to smaller and smaller pieces so it's easier to manage and uh, reason about. And then finally, when we take this approach, we might find that refactoring and adding these new features so that sort of scalability to make our application uh, have newer stuff, it's going to be a lot easier to accomplish those goals with this type of maintainable approach. So how do we actually fit these directives together, because we've only been talking at a high level so far. And it really boils down to what I would say data flow. So this kind of picture here, this graph, where directives are kind of working together, data's flowing up, and this whole graph basically creates what we think of as an app. So when I say we're flowing, handling the flow of data, what I mean is like our model data, things on scopes, for example, and we'll see the different approaches in a minute. And those approaches will have definitely lots of pros and lots of cons. So the first one that we'll end up looking at will be just a very, very basic idea of sharing global state and using prototypal scoping, since this is JavaScript and we have prototypes, harnessing that to do this sort of communication from one directive to another. We can also take another kind of hybrid approach where some parent controller could expose an API that gets uh, disseminated down to uh, directives for them to use. And we can use that as a way to share or um, manage state between these directives. Third, and I've talked about it already, but using isolate scope bindings. You can use two-way bindings or sort of the callback approach. And that's, if you've seen it before with the ampersand, we'll, we'll sh look at that more once we get to this uh, approach. And then finally, we could take an event broach, sort of like an event bus. So we can broadcast and emit events to pass along information from one directive to another. All right, so we'll start off with prototypal scoping. And the application we're going to look at for this is going to be this image gallery directive. And it's going to be uh, composed of smaller directives. And just to give you a high level, the image gallery will allow us to uh, see a few images. We can favorite images. And we can even select an image to be like the main image, sort of like an album cover, for example. 
So our parent directive then will be this image gallery. And it's pretty simple, just a scope and a template URL. And notice here for scope, I'm setting it to true. What that's telling the Angular directive is, I want you to create a child scope, but that's going to basically inherit from the parent scope, sort of like prototypes when you've, if you've taken that approach with constructor functions and creating inheritance patterns uh, with JavaScript. And then we're going to wrap that with a controller. And I'm kind of cheating here for as far as where my data is coming from. So I'm just going to use a controller in this instance. So I'll just go ahead and I'll set up some images. It'll be some cat images because cats are awesome. And then we'll have a placeholder for the main image, the album cover, so to speak. And then any images we favorited. So the HTML for this now, you'll notice already when I look at the image gallery template, this concept of composing directives. So we have three directives, a main image, image list, and image favorites. And those are going to comprise the image gallery uh, directive. And then I'll instantiate the image gallery inside my image controller that I showed you earlier, which supplies some of our mock data. So now diving into those individual components, they're pretty straightforward. The main image, it's just going to display whatever the main image is. The image list, it'll obviously loop over the available images and display them. I can favorite an image when I click on it. I can see the text that's related to the image. And then I can also have a button for saying this, so I want this to be my main image. And then the list of favorited images, kind of the same deal. I'll display how many images have been favorited, and then I'll loop over them, and I'll display again the image, the text, and also a button to unfavorite it. Now, the directive side of these things, the main image, again, that's pretty simple. We're just displaying a simple image. We'll use that scope true again because we're going to make sure we inherit the scope. Image list, it's a little more complex. Notice in the link function, we're going to supply a couple helper functions for setting the main image and for favoriting. So it's going to utilize that uh, global scope, like the main image and image favorites. So I set the main image source when I want to set the main image. And for the image favorites, I'm going to push the image into that array. And then finally, the favorites, similar thing. I'll have a helper function in my link function, which allows me to unfavorite the image, which will just splice it out of the array. OK, so that was a lot of code. But to give you an idea of what we just saw, what that looks like in actual demo, here's basically what we got. So there's our images. Over here, nothing's been favorited yet. If I click on cat, it gets favorited. It goes over here in the list. I can click on set main image, and it'll pop up here, and that's my main image. And of course, I can favorite other images or unfavorite them. So pretty straightforward. But now my question is, what happens if we want to add another gallery? So say instead of just displaying cats, we want to display nature images now. So I'm going to wrap both of these in some parent image controller, and then I have a cat image controller and a nature image controller. And inside of these, obviously, I will, for the cat image, display cat images. And for the nature image controller, display nature images. And so let's try that. Scroll down here. There's the nature images. All right, I'm going to favor the cat image. I'll set a main image. But I'll scroll down to the nature images, and something's wrong. So for some reason, down in the nature images, the cat is set as a main image. And the cats are showing up in the favorites, too. And if I do the same thing down here with the nature images and favorite a couple, they're going to show up in the cat images. And that's not what we desired. That's not right. So what's the problem here? Why did this happen? Remember, we're dealing with shared data. And we're dealing with prototypes. And specifically, we're dealing with objects on a prototype. And show you what I mean. Let's look back at the main image and the image favorites, because those were the ones that were messing up for us. So image control, remember, it's wrapping over all of this. And it has that main image object. So when I set a main image, I'm setting its source attribute. And what that does is because this is prototypal data, when it tries to find out where is main image, it's going to go up the prototype chain. It's going to come up to that global, um, top level object space. And it's going to set it on that. And that since that's shared, that's going to affect 
any other image gallery that I've instantiated underneath here. Same idea here with the image favorites. It's an array, and when I do a push on it, I'm mutating that array, which causes it again to affect all the image galleries. So an approach to fix this then is within each of those uh, inner controllers, I could have a main image inside it for the cat image controller and image favorites, and same thing for nature images, and that kind of solves the issue. And if I try it now, I could favorite these images, set a main image, go down here, and yes, that fixed it. We're good to go. So let me just get all those up there. So we've seen then how to use prototypal scoping to achieve this. One benefit is we could have some top-level stuff, some state, reusable functions, and that can be beneficial if we don't want to duplicate anything. And so it can work too if we want to share data, but we saw that sharing data is problematic when we're dealing with uh, objects and we're mutating that state. And so when we need to fix that, we end up having to do some duplication even. Remember I had to recreate the main image and the image favorites inside each controller. Oh, and also we had to make some assumptions about periscopes and what's available. So the next approach then we could try is this concept of requiring directive controllers. And that's a mouthful, but it's basically this concept of whatever the parent is, is going to have an API that it's going to expose for the children to use. So now we're going to make the image list, which was one of the inner uh, directives, slightly more complex and slightly not. It's going to do this new option called require. And it's referencing a directive name and a caret, and that's saying this has to be a parent. It's basically saying, I want this directive that's named this, that's a parent of me, to be available. And it's going to get mapped into my link function as the fourth parameter. And what that lets me do then is I can reference that parent directive and any public functions that's exposed and use those in my, uh, my scope. So in this case, I will go ahead and set the main image to be the first available image using that API from the parent controller or parent directive. So that parent directive now, the image gallery, I've added this controller function. And going deeper into that then, notice we've kind of moved everything into it. The main image object, the image favorites, the set main image, the favorite function, all these have been moved in here. And see, we can see how these map together, image favorites to the favorite functions. So then the other ones they can require, like the main image and the image favorites, which were some of the inner directives. And we set those in the scope as well, because we'll need the API. So then inside the inner directives now, notice I'm using CTRL, the control, to reference the main image source for the main image directive. Inside the image list, again, I'm using the API from the controller to favorite an image or to set a main image. And then in the image favorites, same concept. I'm looping over the image favorites from controller. I'm also unfavoriting, and I'm displaying the length of them. Uh -huh. I had a, so each of those component, uh, directives, when I instantiated them in their link functions, when I require the controller, it becomes the fourth parameter in that link function, and then I set it on their scopes. And so that's how they were available inside there. So demo, not much change now. It still works like we expect. It's not causing the other image gallery to mess up. And notice the main image was automatically set because we used that uh, API exposed from the parent. OK, so pros and cons of this. So we were able to consolidate that behavior, so we put a lot of the functionality now in that parent controller. And it allowed us to then keep our data sort of private. We didn't have to share data anymore amongst the image gallery, so we didn't have to worry about that mutating data affecting each other. But this did create higher coupling. These child directives now, they expect a certain parent and they expect it to have certain functions available. So you could argue that does create higher coupling, which is not necessarily something we may want. And we still had this issue of a parent controller to supply these images. 
And so we'll figure out a way that we can alleviate some of these issues now with the isolate scopes. So like the name suggests, we're going to let the scope be isolated now. So before, remember, with prototypical scoping, for example, we did this kind of parent-child relationship where you had some sharing amongst the scopes. Well, in this case, these directives now, they're going to have isolate scopes. There's not going to be sharing. It has any type of sharing is more explicit through uh, the bindings, like two-way bindings and the callbacks, which we'll see. So again, no parent scope. And we can't really access other scopes easily. And as I showed before, we'll use the object literal for defining these. So just to dive in just a little more to explain some of the interesting syntax that's used for directive uh, isolate scopes, we'll return kind of to the name tag. So first off, when you set these attributes, and we'll look at the symbols after this, but you can explicitly specify what the HTML attribute will be. In this case, I'm mapping age to age and select hobby to on select hobby. And notice whatever is in the string on the right, that's what we expect to be the HTML attribute you use for the element or the directive when you instantiate it. I can also implicitly, if I don't provide the name, then implicitly in this case it knows to use name as the HTML attribute. Now going to the symbols, that equal sign, that's the two-way bidirectional data binding. And what that's doing there on the bottom is it's, when I say scope name, I'm saying that to name. Whatever your scope name is, it's going to reference something in a scope that is instantiating name tag. And it's going to set that to the name binding on the name tag. And it's going to create two-way binding. So if one edits it in one place, it's going to affect the other. The at symbol, we saw that earlier, that's a, like a literal attribute for uh, HTML. So it's just going to take a string literal. And then finally, the, the really interesting one is when we use the ampersand. And it's, it's a way for us to execute code in the parent scope. And it sounds confusing, so the best way I like to explain it is it's, it's like a callback. You're providing a callback to the directive. So you're saying, here's a function for, in this case, on select hobby. If I select a hobby, it will print out that hobby. And the print hobby is coming from whoever is instantiating the name tag. Print hobby is not a function of the name tag. So it's a way for you to inject behavior or callbacks to certain events. So inside this, we see just the rest of the directive. I has the template and a link function where I'm setting some attributes on the scope. And then here you'll see how those become available. There's the name and the age that were direct, uh, injected from the isolate scope. I can also edit the name. It was a two-way binding, so if I had it in the input, I could edit it. And then when I display the hobbies, I can use that select hobby, which will in turn call that uh, callback that was provided by whoever instantiated me. So it was the print hobby function. And here's just another little thing about the, the callbacks. You'll notice that I'm passing in a, uh, when I do the ng click, I'm passing in an object literal. And down when I passed in my print hobby, it looks like a function invocation, but it's not. So print hobby with hobby being passed in, what it looks like, it's more like a name parameter, so to speak. So you have to make sure when you actually invoke this uh, function with select hobby that you pass in, pass it in as if it were a name parameter with the object literal. All right, so applying this to the image gallery, first off, the thing I want to point out is Notice now that each of these image galleries, I'm going to pass in images to them. Instead of creating separate controllers for controlling the cat images and the nature images. And then here you see the main wrapper image controller. There's where I'm setting cat images and that's where I'm setting nature images. And so I can pass, directly pass those into my image galleries now. In the image gallery now, it's going to have the images, like I mentioned. So there's our two-way binding. And then inside the link function, we've changed it up a little. So there's now we're setting main image, image favorites, and all those helper functions on the scope in here. So looking now at the HTML for it, instantiation of the components is 
gotten a little more complex because now we're going to pass in attributes. So main image, we provide it with whatever the main image is. For image list, we pass in the actual images. Pass in a callback for when we set a main image and when we favorite an image. And likewise, with the image favorites, we pass in whatever the array of images that have been favorited. And again, a callback for unfavoriting an image. Here's where we set those scopes up. It's, it gets a little repetitive, but I want to make sure you see every piece of this. And there's where we reference it in the HTML for the main image with image favorites. Here's where we're doing some of that explicit renaming. So image favorites, that'll be local as far as it'll be called image favorites within the scope of the image favorites directive. But it's HTML attribute, remember, was just images. So let's just keep it shorter. We're using a two-way binding. And then when we unfavor the image, same thing. We get the callback here. Trigger unfavorite gets mapped to on unfavorite. All right, and for the image favorites, we have the, the length. Again, we loop over them, and then we unfavorite the image. Image list, same thing. We do the two-way binding with images. We have a couple callbacks, so we can set the main image. We can favorite it, and notice we're calling these trigger favorite, and that's going to be a way. So when I, if I'm in my image list and I favorite the image, image it's going to call its own function. And then when I call trigger favorite, that maps back to the on un on favorite, which was a callback injected by whoever instantiated me, which was the image gallery. So the HTML for this, I loop over the images, and there's where I set the main image. And the demo looks pretty much the same. This code's available online if you want to see what the code for the demo is as well, because at this point the demos do look the same. So that's isolate scopes. And again, we have some pros and cons. So the biggest pro is we're not sharing anything anymore. So everything is kind of self-contained, and it makes the component more reusable. And it, it kind of made us focus more on smaller pieces because it's reusable, and then we have to use bindings to get things to connect together. And you could argue that by making these bindings on HTML attributes, it's like a well-defined interface or API but at a declarative HTML level. Downsize is we did have to juggle multiple points of state, and it did definitely add more to our markup. We had to have a lot more attributes to get this uh, data to flow. So the last one then I want to look at, which is kind of a, similar to this black box, black, black box approach, is events. So. With events in Angular, there's built-in eventing. So you have some helper functions on scope, like emit, broadcast, and on. And so we can use these like a message bus. If you've ever seen that pattern in other types of applications where events get passed along the bus, and whoever's interested in listening to those events can react to them. Now, the, the concept, though, with events in Angular, though, it's not quite like a bus, is that events travel vertically, up scopes. So a small a directive that was instantiated by another, when it triggers an event, it'll go up to the directive above it. And similarly, a directive above can send direct, uh, events down to child directives. So if you want to have any type of sibling interaction, you'd have to do sort of like a mediator uh, type approach where a parent listens for it and then passes it back down to a different child. So just highlight what scope uh, events look like. Here's emit. And that's going to send events up. So you would use that if a child directive needs to send events up to parent directives. Similarly, broadcast, it sends events down. So that would be where a parent directive needs to notify children directives about a certain event. And then you use the on function to subscribe to these events and provide a callback to react to them. Obviously, the first parameter of this is your event object, like you have in native DOM events. And then any other parameters that you might pass in when you emit or broadcast, those will be available in the callbacks as well. Now, I also I advocate if you want to take an event-based approach is to come up with some sort of naming convention for your events. That way it makes it easier for you to keep track of them. If you know I, you know, I do my event keys this certain way. I typically do like this verb-noun approach. 
So first I have some sort of verb, like some action, select or add, and then colon, and then some noun. So I select a certain greeting or I add an item. So you don't have to take that approach. It's, it's what I like. That I advocate coming up with something that you use throughout your application if you want to use events. So now taking this approach again to the image gallery, notice now the markup's gotten a lot simpler for all these inner directives. The only one we're really still using isolate scope, but you'll notice is on the image list. So mainly because we need to still somehow inject that uh, images for it to use. So notice now uh, I have my set main image again. But when we come into here in the image list, there's the binding. When I set the main image, though, it's not actually doing that yet. Notice it's calling scope emit. And I'm kind of weird convention here. I added in sort of a extra verb where I'm saying delegate set main image. Same thing with favoriting. And this is where anything like a sibling directive, like the main image directive, if it's interested in knowing about this, it can't listen directly to a sibling. So I say delegate, and that's my way to say, I'm going to catch this with the parent and then re-signal, re-send the event back down to whoever's interested, which would be the main image directive. So here's the image gallery, and here's where I was just referencing that. Notice here it's listening for the delegate set main image events, and then it's rebroadcasting them as just set main image and favorite image. So that way then, this main image directive, oh yeah, it's using its own isolate scope here just to keep state separate. And notice also it's using main image by itself now. But now, now see it listens to the set main image event, and then it can set it that way. Take a similar approach with when images are favorited. Again, it'll have its own state now. We've kind of moved state into each component where it makes sense. So image favorites is only in the image favorites directive. And so you can see when I unfavorite it, I can let it do it itself. But now when I listen to that favorite image event, it's again handling adding images to the favorites based on that event coming in. And final demo of that. Again, nothing's really changed, but if you're interested, I encourage you to check the code out and see how these different approaches do work to drive this demo. So, good things about events. We were able to decouple these directives, probably even more so than we were with the isolate scope, because you didn't even, you didn't use a lot of the two-way binding or the callback bindings with the isolate scope we were able to even isolate the state more easily. We moved the object literal for main image into the main image directive and the image favorites array to the image favorites directive. So yeah, we were able to no longer have state in some global object. The markup was cleaner because we did decouple everything. We didn't have so many attributes to pass in uh, callbacks and two-way bindings. Downsides, though, is this does introduce a lot of indirection. It may be harder for you to immediately look at your code base and know how information is getting passed along. And so you have to follow these event pathways to get a feel for the flow again. And you potentially have to remember and duplicate these event names, which that could be pro uh, problematic. So upshot on all that. That was a lot of examples, a lot of code. Refactoring is the big one. So one thing I would say is that it's easier to change or update your application. The, the, what I mean by that, though, is if I need to add a new feature or refactor, ideally by breaking things down into small pieces, when I need to do one of these things, I only go to a certain directive, maybe. I don't have to touch the entire application code base because it's not, no longer like a monolithic application. So that way, you're hopefully not affecting as much of your overall application. Of course, that's good for separation of concerns, and it allows it to be more evolutionary for your app. So applying those then, what if we wanted to do something like this with our image gallery? So we want to remove the count, remove the image text, and sort the images. So no longer is the count over here under favorites. When I favorite the images now, they will sort by the text, cat1, cat2, cat3. And that's the basic gist of it.
So how did we do that? Well, with the image favorites, all I had to do was come in here. I removed that count that used to be in between the list and the header. Where I displayed the text, I just removed that from the markup. And then for sorting, I can just, if the application's pretty simple, I can just use a filter to order the loop of the images. So all that to say then, that I would argue that composition is a pretty critical tool for software development. We've seen several approaches applying that to Angular and how that can help us easily refactor. Now you might find certain cases where you may still have to touch multiple places in your application uh, when you need to refactor. And that may be an indication that better decomposition is in, uh, in place. And that's it, thank you. It was a little early, so any questions? Yeah. So I typically prefer the uh, the isolate scope, even though it, you could argue that it may do a little more direct binding. I used to be a big event guy, especially back in my backbone and marionette days, and I still think there's a place for that, but the the indirection of data flow, that can get really difficult. And since we're talking about maintainability and readability, it, it can be harder to understand. So I've kind of went back to the isolate scope approach, liking it more, because that, in a way, even though the syntax is a little different, that translates well to uh, web components with Polymer or React components, because most of that is, uh, you know, with React, you're passing in props, which are just HTML attributes. So I would say, yeah. Uh, and as far as Angular 2, unfortunately I haven't looked too much in Angular 2 yet. I'm kind of waiting for the dust to settle a little more. But I'm sure some of these approaches, um, I know with Angular 2 that we'll have more of a unidirectional data flow. So there is still bindings. So. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all. <laughs>